Chapter 7 of Pee Wee Harris Adrift. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pee Wee Harris Adrift by Percy Keese Fitzhugh. Apple Blossom Time. Pee Wee stopped in Bennett's fresh confectionery and regaled his drooping spirit with a chocolate soda. Then he continued his stroll up Main Street. He had always advertised his conviction that things invariably came his way, but nothing came his way on this lonely Saturday morning. He paused here and there, gazing idly into shop windows. He stood gaping at a man who was having trouble with his auto, and at last he wandered into the public library. The place seemed like a tomb on that Saturday morning in the springtime. Not a boy was there to be seen. Gee whiz! They've got something better to do than read books, he thought to himself. There at the desk sat the librarian, silent, preoccupied. In the reading room were a few scattered readers intent on newspapers and magazines. The place, familiar and pleasant enough to Pee Wee at other times, seemed alien and uninviting at a time of day when he was usually too busy to call upon its quiet resources of treasure. On this balmy holiday, it seemed almost like school. It had a booky, studious atmosphere which turned him against it. And to complete this impression and make the place abhorrent to him, there sat Miss Bunting, the history teacher, in a corner of the reference room with several books spread about her. To Pee Wee on Saturday morning, this seemed nothing less than an insult. He approached a shelf near the librarian's desk, above which was a sign that read, Books Especially Recommended. Here were always a few old-time favorites, worthwhile books made readily available. From these, Pee-wee half-heartedly drew out a copy of Treasure Island and took it to a table. He knew his Treasure Island. In a disgruntled mood, he sank far down in his chair and opened the book at random. He was too familiar with the enthralling pages of the famous story to seek solace in it now. But there was nothing else to do, and he was too out of sorts to search further. Presently, he was idly skimming over the page before him. The appearance of the island when I came on deck next morning was altogether change. Although the breeze had now utterly failed, we had made a great deal of way during the night, and were now lying becalmed about a half a mile to the southeast of the low eastern coast. Gray-colored woods covered a large part of the surface. This even tint was indeed broken up by streaks of yellow sand break in the lower lands, and by many tall trees of the pine family outtopping the others, some singly, some in clumps but the general coloring was uniform and sad. The hills ran up. Pee-wee blinked his eyes, yawned, then suddenly drew himself up into an erect sitting posture and pushed the book from him. Gee whiz, he mused. That's what I'd like, to go off to a desert island. They don't have any desert islands now. That's one thing I don't like about this century. Hikes and camping and all that make me tired. I'd like to be on a desert island. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to be marooned. Gee whiz, we only kid ourselves trying to make ourselves think we're doing things that are wild. I guess all the desert islands are discovered by now. Oh boy, there were lots and lots of them in the 17th century. That's my favorite century, the 17th, on account of buried treasure and desert islands. Indulging these disconsolate spring musings, Pee-wee sank down in his chair again, a frowning, dreamy figure, and floated out of the library and away from all the sordid environments of Bridgeboro toward a desert island situated in the southeastern part of the 17th century. It was a long, long way off, and he had to cross the 18th and 19th centuries to get to it. He was no longer a pioneer scout now, nor a scout at all, but a doughty explorer about to set foot for the first time on soil that white man had never trod before. He sank farther down in his chair as he voyaged afar, he was soon out of sight of land and almost out of sight of the few readers in that drowsy old library. He continued to sink lower and lower in his chair, as if he had sprung a leak. Only his round, curly head was above the table. The island which he reached was a delectable spot, an earthly paradise, with trees laden with fruit which came down like summer showers when he shook the trees. He wandered about on the enchanted shores and ate so much fruit that oddly he felt that he was himself a tree and that someone was trying to shake fruit out of him. He sat up with a start and found himself confronting the smiling countenance of Miss Warden, the librarian, who had been shaking him not unkindly. Where have you been? She asked, laughing. 
to a desert island, said Pee-wee. He roused himself and wandered out into the balmy air and down toward the river, a lonesome little figure. A broad field bordered the stream, and crossing this, he approached the old car, which was the troop's headquarters. But before he reached it, he was aware of something which caused him to rub his eyes and stare. As sure as he lived, there in front of him was the 17th century FOB Bridgeboro, with all the appurtenances and accessories. He stood gaping at a little island out in the middle of the stream, which had no more business there than Pee-wee had to be dozing in the library. Pee-wee stood stark still in the middle of the field and rubbed his eyes to make sure that he was awake. There was not the slightest doubt that what he saw was very real. The river at that point was quite wide, and its opposite shore was bordered with sparse woodland. Pee-wee had bathed and fished and canoed in this neighborhood almost as long as he could remember, and he was perfectly certain that there had never been an island there. He knew an island when he saw one, and nothing was more certain than this one was a stranger in the neighborhood. Yet it seemed to be perfectly at home out there in the middle of the stream, just as if it had been born there and had grown up there. There was nothing fugitive-looking about it at all. In the true spirit of the 20th century, which is all for time-saving and convenience, it had voyaged to Pee-wee, thereby saving him the time and perils of an extended cruise. It had, as one might say, been delivered at his door. This was certainly an improvement over the old, out-of-date method of desert island exploration. Such patent, adjustable islands would bring the joys of adventurous pioneering within the reach of all, as advertisement writers are so fond of declaring, just as the phonograph has brought music into every home. That's funny, said Pee-wee, pausing in amazement. That wasn't here yesterday, because I was down here yesterday. Anyway, as long as no one's here, I'm going to be the one to go and discover it. Findings is keepings. It's just the same with islands as it is with everything else. To increase his astonishment and cause his brimming cup of joy to overflow, a tree stood upon the little speck of green land laden with white blossoms, which wafted a faint but fragrant promise to the enchanted scout upon the distant shore. That's an apple tree, said Pee-wee, his mouth watering. I'm going over there to discover it, and then it's mine. The whole island's mine, because findings is keepings. That's international law. No doubt he felt that the League of Nations would stand in back of him in the matter of this epic-making discovery. End of chapter 7. Recording by Valentina Vicelli.